Good morning. Uh, welcome to the Mobile Theatre. My name is Matt. I'm hosting the sessions for you this, uh, today and this afternoon. Um, I actually work for a company called Sitecore. We're sponsoring this theatre. Uh, we have a lovely, unassuming stand just behind you. So if you want to know more about us, please pop over and say hello. We're giving away free yo-yos. Come on. Um, so next up today, we have uh, Bridget Randolph. Bridget, Bridget works for the agency Distilled. Uh, she's an online marketing consultant specializing in mobile, and she's going to be talking to us today about five ways that your mobile strategy is losing you money. So please welcome Bridget to the theater. Thank you. All good. It's on. Um, so I had a big coffee just before I started. I might be talking a bit fast, but bear with me. Um, great. So did you know... 57% of users won't recommend a business with a poorly designed mobile site. Or that 40% have turned to a competitor's site after a bad mobile experience. Mobile's huge. And it's already a basic requirement for any online brand. And it's just getting bigger. By 2017, it's predicted that 85% of the world's population will have 3G coverage. And it might be even more with initiatives like Facebook doing internet.org, which is this goal to have 100% of the world's population with internet access. And if we want to take a step back for a minute and look at where it is now based on where it's come from, in 2012, mobile data usage was 12 times the size of the entire internet in the year 2000. So that's 12 times growth. But it's just going up. In the next six years, so in half that time, it's going to be 12 times again what it is today. So businesses need to be mobile friendly. The problem is people are doing it wrong. My name is Bridget Randolph. I'm an online marketing consultant at Distilled. I specialize in mobile. Today I'm going to talk to you about five ways your mobile strategy is losing you money and what you can do about it. So number one you don't have a mobile-friendly website. Now, you might be saying everyone does that, but only 70% of the top UK retailers have a mobile-friendly website, and small businesses are even less likely. There was a recent poll that found that only about 60% of small businesses have a website at all. Only about half of them are mobile-friendly. Still, more businesses will create a mobile site because they feel they should be doing something with mobile, and then they forget about it. But your website is where your online customers primarily interact with you. And if we go back to our stats from before, 57% of users won't recommend you if you have a poorly designed mobile site. 40% will go to a competitor if it's a bad experience. It becomes really important. Now, a lot of people think mobile only matters when you're on the go. Well, 77% of mobile searches happen near a PC. Mobile devices are becoming the device of choice rather than a device of necessity. So if you don't have a mobile-friendly website, you are leaving money on the table. And the fix, it's obvious, make your website mobile-friendly. Now, this doesn't have to be hard. There's three main approaches you can take. Responsive, which rearranges the layout of your website to make it fit onto a smaller screen. Dynamic, which allows you to serve a different page but keep the same URL or a separate mobile subdomain, which is the mobile sites we're familiar with, M dot, whatever your website is. I've got some examples. Starbucks is a responsive design. So you can see here, the desktop site just restacks the blocks on the page to fit onto the smaller screen width. Prime Location is a realty site that has a separate version, M dot prime location dot com. So theirs almost looks like an app. They've cut down on the content on the page. They've made it a lot simpler. Dynamic serving is sort of a cross between the two. Um, can be the best of both worlds. Uh, basically, it allows you to change the content of the page, but keep the URL the same. So you get the benefits of both types. Now, you should choose an approach based on your goals and also your technical capabilities. And don't forget about your users' needs. And if you need help with this, Distilled did a best practice guide for building a mobile-friendly website, and we included a flowchart that can help you in figuring out which approach you should take. But if you're a small business and you have a small website, usually I recommend that you take a responsive template 
from a CMS like WordPress. And these are often quite inexpensive, but they work really well. You can see these are all under $100. If you don't like WordPress, there are other providers that do the same thing. For a larger business with a larger website, dynamic serving is often the best because it gives you more control over what's on the page without losing people when you have a separate mobile site and they have to sort of use a separate address to get to it and it gets complicated. But you might be thinking, well, does it work? So I've got a case study for you. O'Neill Clothing went responsive. They saw these results. Um, I'm not going to read through all of them, but you can see that all of it went massively up and it's been really good for them. But a final point to remember with this is that a mobile-friendly website is not a strategy. It's just the starting point. So what are some other areas we need to think about? Well, number two, you might be making technical SEO mistakes. Why does this matter? Because of Google's mobile index. Google has a separate index for mobile devices. They have a separate crawler that crawls as an iPhone 5. And um, they will check if it works well for mobile devices. And so as you can see here in this slide, these are the Google results for pizza on a desktop versus pizza on a mobile, and it looks very different. So you need to make sure that a smartphone crawler can access your website, can understand what it's about, and can rank it accordingly. Now, if you have a responsive design, you don't need to do anything extra because it's the same code. But what if you can't use responsive? If you're doing dynamic serving, again, it's the same URL. So a lot of it's the same, but you do need to make sure that you use something called a very HTTP header. There's instructions on that link for how to do it. Um, this just indicates to Google that you are serving different content based on what device is, is finding you. And you're not tricking them by showing them one thing and the user something else. Um, but if you have a separate site on a separate URL, you do have to treat it as a separate website. And so there's several things you need to look at. The first thing is redirects. You should be redirecting people when they arrive based on their device. Redirect your mobile users, if they land on your desktop version, to the most relevant mobile page. Not the home page, but the most relevant page. Similarly, redirect your desktop users if they land on your mobile version to the most relevant desktop page. Always allow them to override it with a link to the other version. And again, make sure it goes to the relevant page, not the home page, because this is an error that Google will have problems with. In case you're wondering why it matters to redirect the desktop devices, that's what a mobile version looks like on a desktop. It's not very pretty. This is the page they want to be showing people. A lot more content, a lot more useful. Um, another concern is duplicate content, because duplicate content can affect your rankings um, adversely. And what you need to do with this is include a little bit of code that just tells Google, this is a duplicate page because it's a mobile version of a desktop page. And the code is right there for you. You only need to do this on pages that are du duplicate or near duplicate. Site speed is huge. There's a statistic uh, from a recent survey that found 74% of people would bounce if they had to wait five seconds for your mobile site to load. So we recommend keeping it to no more than two or three seconds, but it needs to be less than five. Finally, don't use unsupported technology. This is a common mistake people make. Things like Flash don't work on mobile devices. And so make sure you understand the limitations of the mobile devices that you're trying to optimize for. And there's more that you can do. I wrote a whole blog post about it on this link. I'm going to post these slides after on Twitter. So if you're worried, you don't have to worry about taking lots of notes. You can get all this information afterwards. Finally, don't forget about testing your site. Has everyone visited their site on a mobile? Maybe, maybe not. A lot of people don't think to, but it's very important to see how it actually works. Here's some tools we like to use at Distilled. Litmus allows you to take screenshots from different devices, and so you can see what it looks like on all your users' devices. Qualaroo does surveys for users, little questions that pop up and say, how was your experience today? Um, they work on a mobile site. Crazy Egg does heat maps. Um, I'm not sure that that works on responsive, but it certainly is usable on a separate mobile site. 
and optimizely allow you to do split testing for different versions of your page to see which converts best. Number three. You might be making this mistake if your permission-based marketing isn't mobile friendly. Because it's not just about the content on your website. Social media is a huge channel for mobile. Four out of every five people who use Facebook daily access it on a mobile device. And the same is true of Twitter. So social marketing is mobile marketing. And you don't want your content to look like this when people try to access it. So anything that you want to get shared on social networks has to work on a mobile, even if it's an MVP version. Um, make, it, make sure it's mobile friendly. This is an example of that best practice guide I showed you earlier. Um, here we have the flow chart. It was too wide to show up properly on a mobile device. So we had our designers do an alternate version that was thinner and fit the width of a smartphone screen. And when it picked up that a mobile user was accessing it, it just showed them this version instead. And also, make sure your social share buttons work on mobile. This is a common mistake, but it's devastating if, if people can't share your content from their mobile devices because that's how they're using social networks. The other thing is email marketing. 62% of emails are now opened on mobile devices. So email marketing is mobile marketing. And I don't want to read an email that looks like this on my phone, because it's too much effort. I'm lazy. So use mobile-friendly email templates. And you can have emails that look like this. Much better. <laughs> um, there's some easy tools you can use. These are both providers that offer mobile-friendly templates as part of their service. If you don't want to use these because you have a preferred provider, you can use their templates and export the code into your preferred program and use that to send out your emails. You can also use Litmus, the tool we mentioned earlier, to test your email campaigns and see how they're doing. Number four, you're overcomplicating the checkout process. This is all about having smarter checkout paths. Now, some people think people don't use mobile to buy things. I wrote a blog post recently, and I got some comments, very you know, reasonable questions. One man said, well, could it be the case that mobile's simply more of a research platform? Fair question. Another man was more blunt. He said, my cell phone's not for buying. It's just a phone. The problem is, they're wrong. In the retail industry, mobile spend is expected to be 15% of all e-commerce spend by the end of this year. That is up from 3% in the year 2010. So as you can see, it's growing incredibly fast. And just thinking back to those stats again about how quickly mobile's growing, I have another slide for you. This is the number of global users of desktop and mobile devices. And as you can see, mobile device use will be taking over from desktop in 2014. So we need smarter conversion paths for mobile. And I have a little rule of thumb, KISS. Not that kiss, this kiss. Keep it simple. Here's a basic example of a way to improve this. Link the form fields on your forms to the correct keyboard on the device. Now, if you're not sure what I mean, this is what I mean. How many of you have tried to fill in a phone number only to be given the letter keyboard? Or had it autocorrect your name into something that's not actually your name? And then you have to back, backspace, and it's horrible. And you have to find the right keyboard down there. Here's some easy little code that helps you fix that. Phone number fields, if you just want number fields. Email fields, so those are the keyboards that include the at sign. Uh, and to disable autocorrect so that on things like names and street names, you're not autocorrecting someone's name into something they didn't want to write. Next, make sure you're only asking for information which is actually essential to the transaction. A great example of someone who doesn't do this is Eventbrite. Um, a lot of you may have signed up for this show on Eventbrite, and what you'll find is they ask for all sorts of stuff, even with a free event, like your billing address or your delivery address. When it's an email that they're sending to you, that's all that they need is your email address. A lot more people might sign up on their phone if all they had to do is type in an email address but instead they make it very difficult and people give up. 
especially when they have intermittent connectivity on the Wi-Fi and the connection gets dropped and it's a pain in the neck. But someone who does it really well is Amazon. They have one click, and I'm sure all of you have used this because it's great. My favorite time I've ever bought something on a mobile it was an Amazon email about a Kindle book. It was Kindle book recommendation. I did want the book because it was exactly the sort of thing I wanted to read. I clicked on the link, it took me there, I hit the button and I bought it. And it went straight to my Kindle. But if you want a, an example from actually someone a little bit more e-commerce-y, who's not as big as Amazon, Argos, still quite big, but they do this well because as you can see, they've made it very clear what the process is. Three steps at the top, you know exactly where you are, and they've only asked for things they need to make your delivery. What's your address? What's your card information? Also keep people logged in long term, because then they don't have to keep entering their data every time they check out. They can just, this is where Amazon works really well. They can hit the button buy and automatically check out. And I have a little thinking bigger thing here, because I think it's really cool. Biometric technology. This is what the Apple Store are doing. In the iPhone 5S, you buy things on the Apple Store with your thumbprint. Now, most of us may not be able to do that yet, but if you can, do it. <laughs> it's great. I love it. And the last thing I want to say here is don't neglect the micro-conversions. Just because people aren't checking out big transactions on their phone, you can forget that they also can do things like social shares and email signups. Make that really easy. Make sure your social buttons work. Number five. This is one of my favorite ones. You're not tracking cross-device and cross-channel. What I mean by this is you need to track the person, not the device. Because we have a problem. If you're tracking each visit separately, which is how a lot of analytics programs work, that's just not accurate. Consumers are taking multi-device paths to purchase. I'm going to give a little example from a colleague of mine who loves Apple products. He always, always buys the next thing as soon as it comes out. His name is Craig. And Craig, as soon as the Apple iPhone 5S was announced, rushed onto the website on his phone, because that was the nearest thing to hand, typed in his email address to get an alert when it was released. Then he left, and he came back on his work laptop when he got the email, just to look at it. He sort of put it in his basket, and then he changed his mind, and um, thought, it's just too expensive, I can't do it. But then later on at home, he caved, and he went back on his tablet, and he actually bought it. And then the day it arrived in the mail, it came to our office, and he got it, and he was really excited and showing everyone. And he decided he needed to get a case for it in case he dropped it. But he didn't want to wait for it to come in the mail. So he stopped off at the EE store on his way home and just bought a case in store. So what's the problem here? Well, at the moment, with visit-based tracking, we have logged three visits from separate people. Only one of those visits ended in a transaction. We haven't even registered the store purchase or the store visit. <coughs> So what I'm suggesting is we need to start thinking more in terms of user-based transactions, or user-based tracking, sorry. Um, and what this does is it recognizes that this is one user. And therefore, it's not three separate people with only one conversion. It's one person who checked out. It's a 100% conversion rate. And also, it's a bigger purchase than we thought because he spent more money in the store. So user-based tracking is all about tracking each step of the customer journey not just each time they hit our website as a separate thing. And one way you can do this is with universal analytics, which is a sort of 2.0 reboot of Google Analytics. Um, the way it works is a little bit tricky because you have to be logged in at the moment. That's how they can tell you're the same person. So if your store has a login, if people do log in, you can then track them using universal analytics. But even with the limitations, it's still much better than anything else that we're doing at the moment. So you should definitely figure out how to get this set up. It's very simple. It's a free thing on the Google Analytics website, and there's lots of information there. But at the end of the day, I mean, all of these are just examples of things people might mess up. And the point really is we need to stop treating mobile as a separate channel because 77% of mobile searches happen near a PC, because it's becoming a device of choice, because in 2014, mobile, use, mobile users are going to overtake desktop users. So we need to think of it instead as a technology that underpins all of our channels, all of our marketing channels. 
it's sort of just another browser and we have to create experiences with that in mind and we have to test with that in mind. So the final takeaways I have for you today are these. You need a mobile friendly website. And if it is a separate website on a separate URL, make sure you check the technical stuff. Make sure it's getting the credit it deserves from Google. Always test your, device, uh, your site across devices. And your permission-based marketing needs to be mobile friendly too. Make mobile checkout easy. Track people, not devices. And mo sorry, mobile isn't separate anymore. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Uh, we have a couple of minutes. Does anyone have any questions? What's the um, Twitter site called? Twitter page called? Sorry? The Twitter page where we can get the uh, slides. What, what's it called? Um, if you just look for my name, at Bridget Randolph, it's on all of here. It's down here. I'm going to tweet out the link. It's a slide share link. Um, and it'll be on the hashtag digital marketing show as well. Thank you. Sure.